Welcome to another edition of Wine and Cheese here at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, where we uncork the canceled and decant with the deplatformed. We're excited today to have with us uh, Professor Dorian Abbott from the University of Chicago, one of my alma maters, so I'm particularly excited to have him uh, with us uh, here today. Uh, professor Abbott is an associate professor in the Department of Geophysical Sciences uh, at UFC, and he is here because of, well, let's let him tell the story. What happened, uh, you were invited to give a lecture, uh, Professor Abbott, at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, as I understand. Uh, what was the lecture going to be about, and why? what led to your disinvitation? So the lecture was going to be about uh, the climate of planets orbiting different stars, okay. which we call exoplanets, and which ones could host life. Okay. Uh, and, and is this a controversial topic uh, in, in any sort of socially controversial way? I mean, this is no. Th this isn't climate change. This is climate on non-Earth planets, I guess. No, and that shouldn't. But that shouldn't matter either, right? Like at university, it shouldn't matter whether someone considers a topic controversial. Sure. Uh, but this was not just a lecture. It was the Karlstrom lecture, okay. which is sort of a big honorary lecture in the field. And in the field of geophysical sciences? Yeah. Okay. And so uh, it, it's sort of like this sort of thing you can, you know, put on your CV and, you know, it's an important honor in the field. Sure. And so I was invited to give this, but last summer I had written an article in Newsweek, an op-ed with my colleague Ivan Marinovich. At Who's Stanford. a professor at Stanford, right. Yeah. Exactly. And he's a game theorist. Okay. Uh, in, in the business school. And we had argued that there are lots of problems with diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, and in particular that they're leading to discrimination against uh, certain groups of people. And so we propose an alternative called merit, fairness, and equality, which would um, you know, make choices for admissions, hiring, and promotion based uh, simply on merit. Uh, and try to eliminate discrimination, but not try to uh, work towards quotas of different groups. Sure. And I, I saw on your on your website at UFC, it says, I practice fair admissions, I select students and postdocs on the basis of scientific ability and promise, and I do not discriminate against any applicant based on anything else. I encourage freedom of expression and the creative exploration of ideas in my group. Well, that... That, that sounds like what you would expect to find in a university so that's, environment. That's uh, uh, this word controversial, yes. which is used now as a way to dismiss ideas that you don't like. That's a very controversial thing to write. And I wrote that on there because a lot of people were writing on their, uh, on their faculty websites things about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you know I'm trying to encourage this or that group. And... So right. I, I thought I would just write, you know, I want to encourage everyone, you know, I, I have in the past worked and I do now with people of all races, sure. men and women, uh, people with different sexual orientations, religious, it, it doesn't matter to me. I want to talk about science when we're in there. Well, you say you practice fair admissions. Presumably that means you're not discriminating based on gender or race exactly. or sexual orientation. Yeah. You know, whoever, you know, uh, I'm, I'm choosing students and postdocs based on their scientific ability, my, the best, I, as best I can assess it. Of course, it's difficult to assess someone's scientific ability uh, in the future based on an application. Sure. Uh, it's not something that you can predict with 100% fidelity, but you can, there are metrics that we can use to do this, and there's a whole psychological literature on how to do this effectively, and it's mostly being ignored. For example, the best predictor of success uh, in, in uh, undergraduate and graduate education is generally uh, a test scores. Okay. And those standardized are tests standardized or? test uh -huh. scores, and those are being eliminated because people don't like, you know, I guess what the data that they generate exactly they don't yeah. like the data they generate but that doesn't mean it's not an effective way to select the most meritorious students right so uh i take it that you were disinvited from the lecture uh, at, at mit how did that come about was it was it professors at mit who were 
No. Uh, so or, or, well, actually, let me take one step back. Yeah. Who, who invited you to give the John Carlson lecture at MIT? Is that something that's decided by the faculty there? Yes. Or? Yeah, so Dan Rothman and Kerry Emanuel are faculty there, and they're the, I don't know exactly the internal selection mechanism, but they're the ones who contacted me and invited me. Sure. And so the students aren't involved in selecting. As far as I know, the students are not prestigious involved. Lecture. But it's important for people to understand that there's there's sort of an algorithm that's followed in cases like this. And so what happens is the the political activists they use Twitter as a force multiplier. So there's a small number of them typically, and and they have different tactics that are used. And so you can see what happened at Yale recently at Yale Law School. Sure. Uh, where the tactic was to just cause disruption. And, and so essentially what happens is they'll go on Twitter and they'll say, we're mad about this, you know, fix this. That's the sort of language that's used. MIT, fix this. Right. Okay. And then the threat. Rescind that's, this invitation. Right. That's what fix this means. The threat right. that's sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit is we're going to show up and we're going to cause a scene. You know, we're going to yell and we're going to stop this guy from speaking. And everyone's going to be uncomfortable. All your donors are going to be uncomfortable. That, that's sort of what's going on. That's a threat that's being made. And it's a force multiplier because it, it's usually a small number of people who are doing this. So in my case, it was maybe a dozen people on Twitter. Uh, but it, it gets people uncomfortable and nervous. And the people, there's always some decision maker. And that decision maker, if you can put enough pressure on him, he's usually some nerd who's just not used to dealing with a situation like this. He doesn't, sure. maybe in his whole life, he's never had people yelling at him. And all of a sudden, it, you know, we're not talking about like the president of the United States or, you know, some politician who's used to these kind of tactics. Right. This is a department chairman or, or, or a, a bureaucrat within the university administration yeah. making these decisions. And they, they get scared and they're like, what, you know, I don't know what to do. Uh, if, well, how can I make this problem go away as fast as possible? And that seems to be what happened. Sure. And so the uh, uh, you're you're disinvited. How does that conversation come about? Do they do well, they, so do they tell you you're being disinvited because there's been a student protest and 12 people on Twitter have have suggested that uh, they're going to you know, make a ruckus if, if yeah. We go so I mean, how, how it happened was the department chair, you know, like he he said he wanted to talk to me on the phone. Okay, so I knew that there was this stuff going on. Sure. So it was after they announced it, this stuff started on Twitter. And a week later, he said he wants to talk to me on the phone. So I thought he was going to say, look, you know, we really value academic freedom at MIT. And we know that there are these people causing problems. And we've explained to them that if they disrupt your lecture, they face the following consequences. But it may be rowdy. It could be rowdy. Yeah. And, you know, this, you know, just, just be ready for it. Uh, but, you know, we're 100% behind you. We know that you're... Uh, the opinions you've given are, uh, you know, that they're your right. It's your right to express those opinions on this issue, and it doesn't influence uh, your scientific work, our evaluation of your scientific work, or the value of the scientific lecture that you're going to give, which has nothing to do with, with this issue. Right. You weren't coming to give a lecture on your Newsweek uh, Yeah. I mean, of course, I wasn't. But even if I was, if, even if I were, that it wouldn't have been appropriate to cancel that lecture in sure. an academic context. Yeah. It's important to emphasize that. But no, I wasn't. It was, it was, I was coming to give two scientific lectures. One, this one about uh, climate on different planets, and the other was about planetary dynamics, like you know, gravitational interactions. And it turns out, I mean, this is kind of an aside, but it turns out that there's a 1% probability that Mercury's orbit will become unstable in the next 5 billion years, and it will hit another planet or it will hit the sun. And so... I was doing some calculations related to that, but just weird esoteric nerd stuff. And, right, so. and so I thought that's what he was going to say. But, it, and so we had a little, nice little chat and then he said, Oh, and you know, like we decided to cancel the lecture. And which had already been delayed once, right? Because of, because, because of, COVID. of COVID. And so I just was kind of like, so, so in other words, you were invited. You hadn't at the, at the time you were originally invited. It sounds like if I'm following this timeline, this op-ed had not been written in Newsweek at that point. No, that's so, possible. I wouldn't have even been invited. Well, so that's the that's the issue that we can talk about in a second. Sure. That, but it keep going. Well, I was just going to say. So then you write the op-ed. Then they reschedule the lecture. Yeah. Then uh, there's this protest uh, 
led by a small group of, of students. And then the yeah. reaction to that is to take the path of least resistance and, and disinvite you. Yeah. And so, and so when he said that, I was kind of in shock because I just didn't think that that would happen at MIT. Sure. Of all places, you know, like they're supposed to be, and they it's are, they are. Nerd kept, central, right? I mean, yeah, and they are, and they are. And, and I really respect the science that people are doing there. And actually, I'm going to visit there in a month to give, you know, another, a, a lecture that they say that, you know, I, we assume it's not going to be canceled this time. Right. Uh, but, and the faculty there are doing great research and there's tons of great graduate students there. So I just didn't expect that. And it, and that, that was pretty much how it went down. I just said, sure. as long as you don't tell, imply to anyone that I agree with this decision, you know, you, it's your lecture, so I guess you can cancel it. But right. Well, well, let's let's talk about this academic culture that uh, that has led us uh, to this place. Is this is this something that you have seen brewing for a while? Is this something when you were a graduate student yourself, for example, was this was this phenomenon something that was happening on campuses that? that you saw in the science, at least in the scientific No, field. there was nothing like this happening when I was a graduate student. Uh, now, the ideology that's behind it was developing. So I was an undergrad from 2000 to 2004. And, you know, this social justice or woke ideology was active in, like, a gender studies department. And I heard people talking about it. A little bit and it was just like funny you know n nobody took it seriously right over here in the geophysical sciences we're not we're yeah not. I mean yeah I was in physics and you know we were okay. doing real work and yeah. you know we were it, it was like okay I guess they can just do their silly stuff over there but it won't they you know they're not gonna bother us right we'll just do our stuff they can do their stuff you know I, everyone can stay in their little area and free, have free to fun. be you and me yeah <laughs> and um, it's, and that and that I mean so I went to school maybe 10 years before you. My experience was, uh, I think the watchword on campus was tolerance. Yeah. And it's just, well, and, and when that word was used, it was typically tolerance of fairly, ex what, uh, yeah. so I grew up in Kansas, what, yeah. where I grew up would have been considered fairly extreme liberal views yeah, yeah, yeah. is what we were all being encouraged to tolerate on campus. Yeah. Well, these words are all, they don't have the same meaning anymore. There's these funny games being played with words. So for example, tolerance now means to restrict the expression of people that you think might, uh, their expression might bother someone else. That's what's called tolerance now. Mm. And so it, it, it's twisted to mean the exact opposite of what it used to mean. A kind of newspeak. Yeah, but the thing is that then people say it, and then it tricks people, other people who believe in the, in the traditional meaning of tolerance. So all of these words, they do that with. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's all being done. So diversity, for example, so this word is being used, but 80% of, of the political spectrum is being excluded. Right. So it's not intellectual diversity. Right. So the, you know, if you look at the typical, the social sciences say, if you, you know, people have done, like Lee Jessam is a, a social psychologist at Rutgers who studied this issue. And that number 80% is, I didn't just pull that out of a hat, like th this is his actual number that the the faculty in the social sciences is composed of 20% of the political spectrum. There's more people who identify as Marxist than who identify as conservatives, uh, which is a shocking, since 50% of our population identifies as conservatives. There's more right. people who identify as Marxist than as conservatives. A center left liberal is considered right wing. And so w under this, the guise of diversity, 80% of the U.S. population is being excluded. Right. And so that all of these words are, are twisted in odd ways. Well, and excuse the perception on campus. I mean, to come back to the word controversial, something that, that is controversial to the, uh, the, the particular 20% uh, of the population that you're saying is found on campus wouldn't necessarily be controversial if the campus were more... Uh, representative of the 100% of society. Yeah, exactly. And so I think in terms of sort of long-term drivers of this, you know, academic cancel culture we talk about, probably the most important one is the, um, is the lack of political diversity. And so, you know, I mean, like, for example, do you know what the dispute at Yale was actually about? Why the students were so mad? 
I, I read a story at the time, but I don't remember now. I know yeah. that, I know that, uh, uh, ADF was, had come right. And I think that there was, there wasn't there someone from Americans for separation of church and state who was also, so it was a as discussion, part of the same discussion. It was a discussion. There were two speakers, both in support of free speech. It was a discussion of free speech, two speakers. One of them was more from the left and one was more from the right. The one from the right, my understanding of what the dispute is, has advocated for traditional marriage. Right. And that was it. Has, that been, was, has been the, uh, the, the lead uh, public interest litigation firm pushing. Yeah. So that was that, side of that was the controversial thing. Right. Now, you know, in most of the country, people might disagree on that, but that's certainly not a controversial position. That's a position held by close to 50%, if not right. 50% of the U.S. population. And probably a higher percentage among married people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so this was considered enough to like cause a meltdown that the person shouldn't even be able to talk about free expression. Right, right. That view isn't even welcome. Yeah. Uh, and they weren't on campus to talk about traditional marriage. They were on campus to talk about free, free expression, expression. Which makes it particularly ironic what it happened. Does. yes. But so the point is that I think that's the main driver is that it's a uh, fish swimming in a sea of left-wing ideology. And uh, so there's the peanut analogy that uh, Jonathan Haidt makes. Do you know the uh, peanut analogy? So he loves this story in almost every talk he gives. Do you know Jonathan Haidt? I do. Yeah. It, in almost every talk he gives, he tells this story that, uh, so, there, you know, when you were a kid, did you ever eat a peanut butter sandwich? Sure. Now you can't bring a peanut butter sandwich to school. Uh, because someone might have a peanut allergy. It's, uh, and everyone's, you know, like super, super worried about peanut allergies. Do you have any children? I do. And uh, have you heard about the peanut allergies and stuff? Oh yeah, for sure. They weren't allowed to do that. Uh, chocolate, you weren't allowed to bring chocolate as snacks, uh, to, uh, uh you know, to, to any sort of holiday parties in someone elementary might school. Someone might be allergic to chocolate or, yeah. or it wasn't fair for the child who couldn't eat chocolate for the other children to eat chocolate in front of that child. I've heard that excuse as well. So. It's interesting. Uh, but anyways, so Haidt talks about the, this Israeli study. And so they have this Israeli food, uh, like a snack food, that's corn puffs with peanut powder on the outside. Okay, so they take some number. I forget the exact uh, number in the study of uh, babies that have been genetically identified to have a high risk of developing a peanut allergy because there are certain genetic markers that are clear and that, you know, are tested for. Okay. And they take, uh, they take half of them and they follow the normal advice, which is don't ever expose your child to nuts. Don't eat nuts yourself because it could get into the child through the milk. Uh, and basically keep nuts completely out of this child. The other one, they say, uh, give the child this, eat nuts yourself, and give the child this peanut snack on this schedule. And the result was, I forget the exact numbers, but a large fraction of the ones who followed the traditional advice were determined to be allergic to peanuts at age five, and a very small fraction of the ones who ate the peanut snack were determined to be allergic at age five through the traditional test where, you know, like they right. expose you or whatever. And so the point is that if you uh, are never exposed to peanuts, you're much more likely to have an allergic reaction, a meltdown, which is what happened at Yale. They had an allergic reaction. And so because these they're not students, being exposed enough to these because these students ideas. have never been exposed to uh, centrist ideas they cause an allergic apoplectic reaction when they see them. Whereas if the students had, you know, if 50% of the students were, you know, believed in traditional marriage and they could talk to their colleagues and realize like, oh, you know, this isn't a crazy perspective and here are the reasons that they think that and stuff, then they wouldn't freak out when someone came on campus and, and said that. So I think that the primary driver of this stuff is, um, is the fact that the politics has gotten so skewed on campus. Sure. And so you, you see that it's happened at Yale, it's happened at MIT. Uh, how is the University of Chicago uh, these days, your, your, your home institution? Well, okay, so in my case, they backed me up. And in fact, there's, uh, there's, so Eric Kaufman is a social scientist who estimates that three in 10,000 faculty each year are subjected to a cancellation attack. Three in 10,000. I would have thought higher. Yeah. And so three in 10,000. 
And that means there, there's an attempt to deplatform them, to have their papers withdrawn, or to get them fired. Okay. And so if a typical large university has about a thousand, a couple thousand faculty, that means every few years you would expect one to have a cancellation attack. These are large prominent cancellation attacks. Okay. And so uh, the important point is that has a huge and outsized impact. So everybody a sees those. Effect. Yeah, everybody sees those and gets scared. And that's why when you ask students and faculty, so many of them say they're self-censoring. It's usually 50 to 80%, depending on the exact survey. Sure. It's, but it's only three in 10,000 who suffer a cancellation mm -hmm. attack. And there have been four in the past 10 years at UChicago. Uh, Mastriefi, Dario Mastriefi, uh, Rachel Fulton Brown twice, Harold Uleg once, and me twice. And so that's I'd six have, I would have Jeff Stone at the law school. He, he, he had a he had an episode here the in the last, yes, thing. exactly. Yeah, but he never actually had a cancellation attack. Okay. He just agreed to do what they wanted him to do. Gotcha. Uh, stop, stop using the word in his lecture. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, uh, so anyways, of those people, all of them are still on the faculty. So that's better than a lot of places. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good sign. That's a good starting uh, point. But w sort of how they fared is different. You know, I feel still supported by the university and, you know, like at least tolerated. There's a lot of people angry at me, but they haven't tried to really come after me. And the president, the former president of the university, Zimmer, issued a statement the first time that was that my first cancellation attack, which was actually fall of 2020, uh, saying, you know, our faculty are free to express themselves on anything and we don't punish them. And that pretty much put an end to the calls to get me fired, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, yeah, it's amazing how uh, one person standing up against, I started to say the mob, but it really is five, 10, 15 people. Sometimes it's not that, yeah. that large a mob uh, can, can really well, stop in my these case, things in their tracks. I had a letter of denunciation signed by about half the grad students in my department. Wow. And so it really was a lot. But, but again, you don't know which ones of them were pressured into doing it. Right. You know, which I know there were a few agitators and, I know that the grad students were scared because they told me. Sure. And so a lot of people who signed it probably were pressured into it. But the it sounds like the end of Dead Poets Society. I, yeah, I've seen, this, this yeah, I've seen it, but I can't okay. remember. Okay. With Robin Williams, right? Right, right. Yeah, where the, the students were pressured into denouncing the professor at the end. Ah, yeah. Okay. So same sort of thing. But, uh, but anyways, but I think Dario, Dario Mastriefi and uh, Rachel Fulton Brown have had more negative experiences and I think Harold has had a slightly more part. They tried to get him. He, he made a post on Twitter, uh, criticizing the defund the police idea in okay. the summer of 2020. And they tried to get him, you know, removed from being the editor of the journal of economics. And they did get him off the, some reserve board, something or other. And, but, you know, he's basic. I think he, he would say that he's mostly, you know, survived it. Okay. So, still, so still teaching, Chicago still has been in, you know, better mm -hmm. than most places, let's say, but not, uh, not, uh, fulfilling its obligations. And so for, so we have the Chicago principles, which most people have heard of. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is from a report actually chaired by Jeff Stone, who you mentioned mm -hmm. about 10 years ago. And it basically says everyone's free to say what they want. It doesn't matter if someone's offended. Okay. And, and Yale has the C. Van Woodward report that they've been you know, sticking uh, or have been pointing to since the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, but it seems to be honored more in the breach. Sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But an equally important report that we have from 1967 is the Calvin report. And this one says that the university and, and all uh, units of the university cannot make statements on social and political issues unless they're directly relevant to university function. So to give you an example of directly relevant, uh, there was an issue where the government was trying to mess around with visa status that would have affected a large number of our students and faculty, and the okay. university made a statement saying, you know, we're against this. Now, that's perfectly legitimate and, and fine. But making statements about uh, 
this is the university as an institution, as shouldn't, an institution. shouldn't be making statements. This yeah. isn't about what the individual professors can The whole point say. is to protect the ability of individual professors to say what they want. And so if the university makes a corporate statement, number one, it ostracizes anyone who has an opposing view. And number two, it can be used as a justification to punish those with an opposing view because you say like, oh, we're not, you're not towing the line. And uh, number three, it emboldens the people who want to uh, suppress the opposing view. So th th that's sort of the motivation here. But starting in 2020, there was a serial uh, violation of, of this principle. And so it, it's gotten better now, but there was a good year and a half where we were getting emails about court, the outcomes of court cases and why we should think this way or that way. As corporate statements from the university. Yes, from the provost, from the provost herself. And, uh, you know, about uh, different shootings and protests and what we were supposed to think. And just, just terrible violations of the Calvin Report. And so that's the sort of thing where the University of Chicago really failed in its commitments. And we're, we have a faculty group called U Chicago Free, and we're, we're still lobbying to get those statements taken down. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay. Terrific. Well, let me let me broaden out a little bit and and talk about uh, get back to the, the the topic that I guess created the uh, uh, I'm going to try to use a word other than controversy uh, that that led to the this case, the kerfuffle. <laughs> uh, so fair admissions and 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 treating people on a on a, a non discriminatory basis uh, is something that we certainly. Uh, preach here at the new Civil Liberties Alliance. And so, for example, we have uh, we have litigation going against uh, NASDAQ and the, the Securities and Exchange Commission over its uh, board diversity requirements because yeah, yeah. they have they have set up a rule that yeah. requires a minimum number of folks on the board with a certain you know, gender and, and race or sexual orientation. You know, California had such a law that was just uh, overturned, right? Correct. It was just struck down by uh, uh, under California state law, I believe. Exactly. And so this case that, that we're involved in is pending at the Fifth Circuit in Texas and is a uh, in federal court. Uh, and the, the You filed it there are, on purpose because you think that it will be more sympathetic? Or? So uh, we actually filed in the Third Circuit, in, in uh, which is based in Philadelphia, but there was a pre-existing case that had been filed and our case was consolidated uh, with that case in uh, in Texas. And you, where's Judge Ho? I think his name is. I've read some of it. Is he in the Fifth Circuit? He is in the Fifth Circuit. Because I've read uh, some of his stuff, and he, he seems to be. Uh, speaking of University of Chicago guys, so Jim was a classmate of mine. Oh actually, wow! So, yeah, uh, he, he just uh, his opinions have been so clear, and he, he just gets the issues involved here. He will he will be delighted to hear you say that. <laughs> but uh, uh, so. The reason I mention this is I feel like there's probably a connection between what we see on the university campuses where these policies are yeah, yeah. Are, are maybe uh, incubated uh, and then what we see in wider society 5, 10, 20 years later. If that's, if that's true, what can we do on the university campuses now yeah. to inculcate a broader perspective on the part of, of students yeah, yeah. to... To inoculate them, if you will, to feed them the peanuts, if you want to, if yeah, you want to yeah, use yeah, Jonathan yeah. Haidt's uh, terminology. Yeah. Well, so it's funny because it spreads. It starts in one of these radicalized departments, and then it spreads to the university, and then like it shows up in my office. And so like I just want to be doing science and working with the best scientists possible, and instead we're talking about DEI half the time, and then it spreads to the whole rest of society. And so uh, it's you're you're right that it. It sort of like goes out in these waves right. in circles. So what do I think we should do to fix the problem on campus? What's right. Dorian Abbott's prescription? Uh, first, you have to understand who's causing the problem. And freedom of expression is actually not being supported by faculty very well. So there's basically two types of faculty. This is like super uh, generalization. But there's sort of two types of faculty on a typical university campus. There's the ones in the in the sophisticated technical fields, rigorous fields. Uh, and those can be in various areas. They can be in the social sciences. They can be in the sciences. Uh, they, you, you, can, you can have a classicist who is in that type of field. And so these people are so obsessed with their field that they don't have time to deal with the SBS. 
don't pay a lot of attention to what's going on outside. Yeah, and there's just no way to get to the highest level to get tenure in that area. And so I was like that. I had no no idea what was going on, and like I stumbled into this mess, and and I only know about it because I had to figure out what the heck was going on so that I could respond and defend myself. Uh, okay, so that's category one. And they just don't think much about academic freedom. They take what they have for granted and they just stay in their lab and do their work. And then there's the people in the not rigorous fields. Uh, and they are often actively antagonistic to academic freedom. They don't think of the purpose of a university as a pursuit of truth. They think of the purpose as a university faculty uh, as activism. So this is a this is a base camp for yeah, exactly. For you know, you've got to use your your uh, privilege to actively try to change society. That's the whole thing that we're, that's the whole point of what we're doing. We're not trying to pursue the truth. We're trying to change society and reshape it in a way that we think would be better. And these would be people who would be in like, in any department that's called like X studies, something studies, they would tend to be more in this category. But They've spread, you know, like an English department would have a lot of people now, like, you know, they're not going to be teaching Shakespeare and just so into Shakespeare that they want to spend their life reading Shakespeare. They are involved in this, you know, activism stuff, and they're not necessarily ready to defend academic freedom because it's not the most important thing to them. So these are the two main categories, but neither of them is, is tends to be ready to defend academic freedom. And so the faculty are not necessarily the best advocates in this case. Uh, so, so what's different now? I mean, we had, uh, as far back as like 1990, we had books on tenured radicals, or we had Alan Bloom's Closing of the American yeah. Mind. Is there something that that has happened so that since process, that time? That, yeah, that, that process that was identified by writers like you mentioned has just accelerated and reached its uh, end game. And so... Lee Jessam has the exact statistics who I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. I think it was in the 80s and 90s w when you mentioned, I think about 80% of faculty were left-wing. And according to Jessam's statistics, it's more like 95% now. So there's a tipping point. It's, at some point, just there, there aren't so enough extreme. people on campus yeah. with a diverse viewpoint that... They just can't... Yeah, there's nobody there who's willing to advocate for the other side or there's just not a, like you say not enough that it makes a difference and so i think that's probably the issue okay and then the talking about our various uh, actors who could influence the academic freedom situation so your original question was what what can we do right okay so faculty i have probably, a theory i'll run by you but i want to hear yours first faculty probably cannot be relied upon okay uh well, that's discouraging because, the, if anything, I have to think that the administrators at the university are even right. further so left point than two, the faculty. Point two is the administrators. Their uh, interests are often not aligned with the supposed interests of the university, which is the pursuit of truth. Their interests tend to be, well, more about like... Uh, Compliance. Get, yeah, getting, you know, moving higher up in the administration right increasing and budget increasing budget and uh, finding jobs for more minions which makes them more powerful which means they make more rules so that they have more things for their minions to enforce and then the administration grows and grows and grows sure. okay so those guys we can't count on them I mean there, there could be someone here or there who's going to be sympathetic but it's not we're not going to count on that uh, I think the, the main agents who can help are the alumni and the public and so the alumni, their leverage is that they uh, they give donations, mm -hmm. and alumni tend to care about their institutions. And so the other thing is they come from the student body, which tends to be less extremely polarized. It's still polarized, but less polarized than the faculty and the administration. And so there they there have been free speech alumni groups forming across the nation and they have been writing letters to the presidents and you know saying we're not going to give you guys any money anymore or they'll take their money and give it to someone else so for example at Princeton there's this Madison program run by Professor Robert George mm -hmm. who invited me to give the lecture at MIT that I was supposed to give at MIT on the same day on the same day you, you gave you yeah, gave yeah, the yeah. lecture at Princeton and said and I think like more than three well maybe you shouldn't be here you weren't really the platform then so. yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. I'm just teasing. it was a different. I was, I was, re, I was uh, translate, 
trans platform. Trans platform. <laughs> yeah, it went from one platform to another platform. Right. But uh, so they, you know, people after that, the alumni said, "I'm to Princeton. Look, I'm going to give my money directly to Madison program." And so that's one one type of leverage. Sure. And then here's the other one that you might be interested in. So this is more of a proposal that I would like to discuss. I'm not saying necessarily this is the solution because obviously I'm not a lawyer and I don't think about the, it, it's very important to think about the, the long-term consequences of things and that's not, uh, this isn't my field so I haven't thought that through. But So here's the point I would like to I don't to know, discuss. you said Mercury is going to maybe go out of orbit in five billion years. It sounds like you're in it for the long term. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't know about legal long-term consequences sure. and uh, what could, you know, unexpected results. So here's the proposal. So we have the 1964 Civil Rights Act. We have Title VI and Title IX, which uh, are supposed to prevent discrimination on the basis of race and sex. Right. Uh, and so any institution that takes federal money, either through uh, scientific grants or uh, tuition, has to, uh, as a condition, they have to be compliant with Title VI and Title IX. So my proposal is that we have some sort of legislation that says you have to ensure academic freedom and you have to uh, ensure political neutrality. You can't make political statements as a university in order to receive federal funding. Now, this, the reason that I'm worried about that it might be a bad idea, so the reason it's a good idea is because most of the public would support something like this from both sides. And, but the reason here's the reason I'm worried it's a bad idea. So what if you have the guy who's appointed by the government to certify that the university is upholding academic freedom, who's actually a left wing ideologue and antagonistic to academic freedom? And so that's sure. and so how do you ensure that such a situation doesn't arise? And so anyway, so what do you think about that idea? Well, I, uh, I think that I could imagine it working better at the state level. So if you're talking about your flagship state universities, uh, typically the uh, those universities get a fairly substantial amount of their funding from the state legislative sure. process. And the state legislatures, uh, almost everywhere you go, uh, tend to be a fairly good reflection of the of the population. Because but that's the nature of the it's system. The, right, yeah. that's the, it's representative democracy, right? So there may be some states, and I don't know where Illinois would, would, would fall on this uh, spectrum, there may be some states where the flagship state university would be able to persist in this sort of uh, far left liberal, uh, non diverse, non academically diverse, non ideologically diverse position. But I think in a lot of states, if the state legislature really took an interest and said, "Look, you you cannot continue to have a one sided perspective," yeah. uh, that that from a funding standpoint, the universities would be forced to uh, to have different hiring practices, have different uh, neutrality practices, uh, as you're talking about. I think that there's less risk there uh, because there's so much responsiveness on the part of, of elected officials. I think it's trickier when you, and one of the things we worry about at the New Civil Liberties Alliance is empowering bureaucracies, empowering yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I asked you that question. agencies. And, uh, but see, that's a real leverage because the, the public is funding, you know, like the reason you Chicago can exist the way it does is because of public funding, right? We would have right. a totally different business model if we had to depend entirely on student tuition. Sure. And so the public should have some say. And a different admissions model if you had to depend entirely on, exactly. on tuition. Yeah, I mean, okay, I guess you could still have doing it. You could still have the endowment and whatever. But right. but it seems to me that the public, it, you know, they the public thinks that they're funding universities to deliver on, you know, increasing knowledge and educating students. And if they're not doing that, then the public should be able to say, well, you know, that's fine. You can do your thing on your own, but we don't want to pay for it. Right. No, I think that's right. There, if there's no public benefit to the kinds of research that are, that's being done or the kind of, of uh, 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 education that's being given out, then the reasons it's to worse. support it it's are... Worse. And when we have a, what, 20-some trillion dollar yeah. uh, deficit... It's worse than no benefit, benefit, like you pointed out. All, all of these terrible ideas are spreading out of the university. It's so a detriment. You're, fu sure. you're funding something that's destructive to society. And it seems like, seems to me that the public should be able to in some way influence it. But I don't know what the instrument is. If you don't like my idea, do you have another idea for 
what sort of instrument could be used to affect that solution? Well, I think that if you if, if the state legislatures uh, were to exert more influence over the flagship state universities, I think that there would be a, a knock-on effect to, to the private universities as well. If you, because I think students actually would be attracted to flagship state universities that that had a more yeah, intellectually yeah. diverse viewpoint, there would be more competition for those students, yeah. and then I think private universities would would, from an admission standpoint, say, well, if we're going to lose talented students to universities that are actually preaching intellectual diversity and, and living by it, then we may need to change our way of doing it as well. Maybe that's uh, Pollyanna-ish to think that that uh, would happen that way, but yeah, I, I have more confidence in that than I do in a federal bureaucracy dictating anything to, uh, to private universities. Yeah. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, I saw in one of the articles that was written about uh, about your experience that your your wife is from uh, Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and she had a particular perspective on on what what happened. Is that something you can share with our audience? Yeah. So, uh, well, I'll, can I tell a few stories? Sure. So when I first met my wife, uh, she showed me a picture of her mother. Her mother's a teacher, and two colleagues. And it it was like there's a day in Ukraine where every all the children bring flowers to the teachers, and so they were each holding flowers and they were scowling at the camera and I said why aren't they smiling and she said she looked at me like I was crazy and she said no one who lived through socialism smiles and so it turned out that was a little bit of an exaggeration but in public it's true it's much more true so people who lived through socialism don't tend to smile in public uh, because they're scared of you know who knows what could happen? Like, right. you know, like someone's What's lurking like, behind that smile. Why yeah, are you happy? What, exactly. are you, what are you getting away with? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, but she does smile at home and make jokes and stuff. Uh, so that sort of, she was born, my wife was born in 1989 at the tail end of, of the socialist system. But even so, they were still persecuting. So she was baptized in secret because her mother would have been fired. So the priest came to her house. Her mother would have been fired if they knew that uh, she was Christian. Right. And so there was repression all the way to the very end. And then, you know, when just like other random stages about Ukrainian democracy, you know, like my wife, they, they paid you to vote there, or at least they did when she was there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she took the money, but then she voted for who she wanted to vote for. And her mother was really, really mad at them, at her. And she said, they're going to come. They're going to count the votes in our village. And they're going to come punish us all if the votes don't match what they paid for. And so it kind of gives you a sense of, you know, mm. what, uh, what it's like to live through. That didn't happen. But what it's like to live through that sort of system. Sure. And uh, so anyway, so when I started telling her about what was happening, you know, what I was observing, she said, that reminds me of what my mother told me about Soviet times. And... I don't know, it just that had a big effect on me. Like that that we can't have that here. You know, if that if someone who's so close to that experience, if that's the first thing she thinks of, we we gotta do something about this. So that really inspired me to say to speak out about these issues. But then when I first got in trouble, I thought I might get fired. And so I told her that. And she said, you know, I know what it's like to be hungry and not have enough food to eat. I know what it's like to be cold and not have warm clothes, and I'm not afraid of that in this country. I'm with you. Whatever happens, just you know, say what you need to say. And so that's when you have that kind of support, it's much easier to uh, you know go against a a system that is you know you feel is unjust and that you need to say something about. Absolutely. Well, I'm. I'm thrilled that we have uh, some professors out there who are still willing uh, to take a stand. I'll throw it open to questions from the audience here in, in just a minute, so I'll give you give you a little bit of a uh, warning. Uh, but uh, uh, but I wanted to to find out. So you were able to eventually uh, so give the give the lecture to the James Madison program at Princeton. How did it uh, How did it go over? Well, it was fun. It was just you know science is supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be this you know. Stupid fight. Everything the students at Princeton politics. didn't converge in mass and no, shut, well, it was on, it was on Zoom. Okay, okay. So, but uh, everyone, you know, like everything's not supposed to be politics. There's different 
parts of life. And, you know, you should be able to go have fun and do science with people that you disagree with about who should be the president. And so, you know, that's, that's what it was like. We just, we had a fun meeting, you know, thousands of people attended. Uh, there was a nice introduction by Robert George and by Burnout Trout, a professor at MIT, who was upset about the situation. And uh, I got many dozens of emails from people who watched it, who had questions about the science, and we talked about the science, and we had a great time. Terrific. As it, as it should be. We, uh, a couple of people here have heard me talk about, uh, about this, uh, but one of the ideas I was exposed to at, at Chicago in law school uh, was the idea of incompletely theorized agreements is the fancy term for it, but it basically means we don't have to agree on everything to agree on some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if we, if we have a world in which uh, before we can even engage in scientific discourse, we have to agree on 100 other things that have nothing to do with the scientific conversation we're having, then we are not going to have the same sorts of rich scientific conversations uh, that, that we need to have. Or, or the same thing in the commercial world. If I have to, I mean, if, if you're selling a chicken sandwich and I want to buy a chicken sandwich, that should be the extent of the, of the transaction. If we have to agree on a, on a hundred other uh, political yeah. points, then, uh, you know, I'm going to be buying fewer chicken sandwiches. They're going to be selling fewer chicken sandwiches and, and commerce will no longer be a lubricant for social relations. It'll be an irritant. And yeah. so I think this is an important concept that, that we don't need to agree about everything in order to have free discourse. Yeah. So that is an extremely unpopular. So what you just said would get you called a fascist and a Nazi. <laughs> Uh, that's an it wouldn't be the first time. That's an ex extremely unpopular position to be advocating. And, and, and that argument should be made more clear. I mean, let me give you an example. Although I will say that argument was made, I was taught that by Cass Sunstein, who's he's now at Harvard Law School, but it, uh, certainly a left-wing uh, professor. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have, all. we don't have to straightjacket everything into right-left. Yeah. But uh, that, that argument uh, right now, so what, it's more like silence is violence is the term that people would use. So if, you know, if you're going to be even silent, you don't even have to, you can't even stay silent on these issues. You have to positively affirm the accepted narrative or else we don't want you anywhere near us. Right. You can't sell chicken sandwiches if you're not. Yeah. It's not that you can't even, you know, sell chicken sandwiches and have a pleasant disagreement about who should be president. If you aren't with the right guy, then you shouldn't even be allowed to sell them. And if you aren't willing to put up the sign that says, I support this guy, you know, the green grocer, you know, the green grocer story. I don't. The, it's about the workers of the world unite sign. It's a Czech dissident, Harklov. I can't remember how to pronounce his name. Harklov Pavel? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And he has this story of the green grocer. And why does this guy put up the sign, workers of the world unite? So everyone's got to be the green grocer now. Everyone's got to put up the right sign or else uh, they want to make it so you can't participate in society. Right. And that's a huge problem. And so that perspective you just said, if you can argue that point and convince people and, and put it out there. So an example is Edmund Burke. So pretty big thinker, like an important thinker, right? Sure. I didn't hear of him until I was in my 30s. And I have an undergraduate degree from Harvard. Okay? Right. I'm not a dum-dum. So like what? What, why is that? Why aren't these perspectives being taught and being heard? You know, and so that's a perspective that sh people should get out there more and sure. say, like, look, here's the argument. That this is why we should do this. Let me throw it open to our audience. Any questions? Uh, any questions from from the audience? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so NCLA uh, has focused uh, one of our areas on uh, the problems of due process in public universities and Title IX uh, being an issue. Have you seen, uh, do you have any stories or uh, any anecdotes in, in your experience as a professor where um, you've seen some of those kinds of due process abuses? Um, and do you, do you think it's a problem that is sort of a, a part of this larger issue? Yeah, there's a professor at, in Florida. I can't remember which Florida university he's at. Uh, might be Central Florida, named Naji or something like Charles Naji, something like this. Anyways, he, in 2020, he made some posts on Twitter uh, against the BLM movement, and people got really mad, and they wanted him fired. This is a tenured professor, and so the response of the university was, well, we can't just, like, fire this guy because we don't like his posts, so what we'll do 
they launched an investigation where they asked every current and former student and employee to send in complaints against this guy, Title IX complaints. With no, no one had filed any complaint before. They just started their own thing. And they fished up a couple. And it was things like, 10 years ago, you said something in class that I didn't like, okay? And like, you know, he can't remember what happened in that class. And the thing that you said that I didn't like, it may have been completely innocuous 10 years ago, but now we can reinterpret it through this new interpretive lens and we can make it into a Title IX complaint. And then they, he showed up at their office and they, you know, presented him 10 years of complaints from all these students all at once and asked him to defend himself with no preparation. And so that's, that's sort of like the extreme case. And then they fired him. Then, uh, so he's suing them. But th that would be like how you can use Title IX in a weaponized way to uh, stifle dissent from the position that the university wants to maintain. Other questions? Yeah, have you, have you found a growing movement of professors who share your view? And if so, are you optimistic of the direction that it's heading? No. Not really. I mean, there's the, I wouldn't necessarily call it a growing movement, but there are some, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who support the positions that I've been advocating. There are very few people who are willing to openly say that. So one example that I just would like to highlight is uh, David Romps at Berkeley. And so at, at, after this issue at MIT, David Romps was in my field. He was the director of the you know, climate center or whatever at Berkeley. And he proposed to the other faculty that they should invite me to give the lecture as sort of a statement that, you know, we're, you know, we're a scientific institution, not a political institution. And we'd like to hear what this guy has to say, even if other people disagree with his politics. And, and even tweak MIT a little bit too, why not? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, exactly. And that's what that was going on with Princeton too. Is, sure. So, uh, the faculty said, not only are we not going to do that, but we, we never want to invite that guy to give a seminar ever again. <laughs> and so he resigned. He resigned as the head of this thing, and he posted it on Twitter. And that's, you know, that real, takes real courage. And so there are some people like that. There's, I hear from hundreds and hundreds of faculty who are scared with good reason. And not willing to speak up, and we do have an organization. We have about fifty people at U Chicago called U Chicago Free. Uh, all faculty. All members. all faculty, almost all tenured faculty, and two of us got elected to the council. Harold Uleg and I got elected to the council of the university senate, and we've been, you know, trying to advocate these positions. It's extremely unpopular. So we had a recent vote that was relevant for this, where they wanted to make a whole department. They did make a whole department called race, diaspora, and indi indigeneity that was grounded in the critical social justice perspective and exclusive of alternative perspectives. And so we argued against that, and I think we lost the vote. I think we got four votes on the council, which is 53 people. And so it's, I don't think, there's not an over, like a, a surge of faculty who are going to respond to this, I don't think. Are there other departments that exclude other views as part of the definition of the department? That seems like an unusual thing. No. So, I mean, one of the arguments made in the council was, oh, well, of course they say, like, they try to use wiggle room and say, we're not really excluding views and et cetera, et cetera. But one of the arguments was, oh, we have an economics department and they're, they're all, you know, in favor of free market. But if you look at the economics department, what, you know, what they say they're doing, there's no assumption of your... Uh, which perspective you commitment to capitalism, yeah. and in fact, they 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 have people on the right and the left, and they're actually the funny thing about the U Chicago Economics Department is considered right wing, uh, but the current U Chicago Economics Department has almost I think there's only one person who identifies as a Republican. I was going to say I think, I think Austin <laughs> Goolsbee was uh, was Barack Obama's uh, yeah uh, lead economist. So. Casey Mulligan definitely identifies as a Republican. Yeah. But I'm not sure there's anybody else there. Well, uh, I think that about runs out of time uh, today. So uh, thank you for, for coming and sharing uh, your views uh, here at the New Civil Liberties Alliance. We're delighted to, uh, to give a platform uh, to folks who have been deplatformed and help to, to spread some of these views. I, I, you know, I, I think that 
the kind of uh, fair admissions that, that you practice and you encourage to others to practice is, is what we need in order to uh, to keep academic uh, freedom alive and appreciate your commitment uh, to doing that and appreciate your uh, sharing your story with our audience today.